Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We are just starting out on our District 6 City Council candidate discussion. Um, I'm Jennifer Omi with the Piedmont Heights Business Alliance, one of the hosts of this event. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our other co-hosts, uh, Marla. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Marla Johnson. I'm the communications chair for the Morningside Linux Park Association. Um, we are really proud to offer this forum with our friends in Piedmont Heights as we all seek to become better informed and more engaged neighbors in District 6. So thanks so much for being here. Wonderful. And our other co-host is uh, Meg Anderson with Piedmont Heights Civic Association. Hi, everybody. A warm welcome from Piedmont Heights. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to take time to join us tonight to learn more about your City Council District 6 candidates. So welcome, and we're excited to have you. Great. Thank you, Meg. Um, we are pleased to be providing this opportunity to our residents and businesses of the District 6 communities of Ansley Park, Atkins Park, Brookwood Hills, Druid Hills, Edmond Park, Lindridge Martin Manor, Lindbergh Morasco, Morningside Lennox Park, Piedmont Heights, Sherwood Forest, and Virginia Highland. District 6 also includes the campuses of Emory and CDC. Tonight's event is being streamed on the Pi High Alliance Facebook page at Pi High Alliance and will be available for replay on all the host Facebook pages after the event. This is a discussion and not a debate. Our moderator, Tom Baxter of the Supporter Report will ask each candidate the same questions covering district approach, planning and development, public safety and constituent services. Each candidate will have a two minutes to answer the questions. Each candidate will be given a 15 second warning before the time is up. The candidates will also give opening and closing statements. We're happy to say that this event is virtual and we wish it was in person and it will promptly end at 8.30. So thank you for joining us and being an active participant in choosing our District 6 City Council representative. Early voting starts October 12th and election day is November 2nd. So remember, please vote. So as people are starting to enter, we're gonna go ahead and have a few um, items in the chat. So if you can, those of you who are here, please go ahead and turn your attention to the chat. And Meg will go ahead and put some questions in there and we will get started in two minutes. I'm gonna launch a poll. So this one is very interesting. We wanted to know, have you ever met your District 6 council person before? Have you ever met? We have 41 attendees, so there we go. Great. I'm gonna end that poll. I'm going to share the results just so you all can see. So 57% said yes and 43% said no. So I think that's a really great place for us to start and know how involved uh, our city council have been in, with our communities. So thank you. Um, Meg, do you want to launch the other one? Um, ask about representation. Sure thing. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, let us know where you're joining from. What neighborhood are you representing tonight? So go ahead and throw that in the chat. Sherwood Forest, Morningside Lennox Park, Piedmont Heights, Morningside, Virginia Highland. Linridge Martin Manor. All right, looking like we have some good representation. 
I hope throughout the night, we're gonna see others that are represented in other neighborhoods. Lynn Morasco, yay. Great. Okay, so it is 7.04 and I'd like to go ahead and introduce our moderator. We are pleased to welcome back Tom Baxter as our moderator. Tom Baxter has written about politics and the South for more than four decades. He was national editor and chief political correspondent at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and later edited the Southern Political Report, an online publication for four years. He has been a fellow at the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. He serves on the board of the Thanks Mom and Dad Fund and is a member of the Atlanta Press Club Debate Committee. He and his wife, Lily, live in District 6. They have three grown children and seven grandchildren. I am so pleased, Tom, that you're here with us tonight. So I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And we will begin tonight with uh, all three candidates taking a couple of moments just to introduce yourselves and tell us why you're running for this position and why you think you're qualified. And uh, let's begin with Courtney D. Dye. Courtney? Hey, everybody. Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Courtney D. Dye, and I have been living in Atlanta for about 20 years, and I've been living in District 6 for um, about six years now. I am a successful small business over owner in the Cheshire Bridge Corridor. Um, and part of the reason why I'm running is because of the recent bridge fire on Cheshire Bridge. Um, I just, you know, I became a little frustrated with the city not being able to take my calls or really provide me with any sort of solutions. Um, and so that's why at the last minute, this was not on my 2021 docket, I just threw my hat in. Um, I'm also the daughter of an airborne ranger and then Metro Atlanta police officer and my mom is a realtor. So I come from a strong background in crime and addressing that and community policing and having that sort of influence in my life. So I'm really looking forward to bringing that knowledge to addressing the current crime issues in our neighborhood that I believe is, you know, top of everybody's mind right now. Um, I also used to serve on the board of directors for the Atlanta Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and my neighbor has just decided to start doing work in his bathroom. Sorry about any knocking noises. Um, Zoom life. And um, so anyway, I'm just really looking forward to serving my community on a broader level. And I really appreciate you guys having me here tonight. Thank you. Alex Wan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alex Wan, and uh, I would like to be your next city council uh, district six representative. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a 27 year homeowner in Morningside. I grew up in Stone Mountain. I uh, went to Georgia Tech, have an engineering degree from there and an MBA from Morton Business School. Professionally, I'm executive director of Horizons Atlanta. We provide tuition-free summer enrichment programs to about 1,300 public school students around literacy, math, and swimming. And we actually have kids in our program from the Midtown High School cluster. Uh, before that, I worked at Emory University. Uh, and in terms of community service, I, I serve on the Piedmont Park Conservancy Board as well as I've served on the Atlanta Regional Commission Board as well. Um, but that the piece of my background that is most relevant to the conversation tonight was that I had the privilege and honor of representing District 6 on the Atlanta City Council uh, for two terms from 2010 to 2018. Um, the reason why I'm running is, quite frankly, the city just feels broken right now. Um, I think it's failing us when it comes to just the fundamental services it's supposed to be providing to its constituents and residents and taxpayers. Things around public safety, we don't feel safe in our neighborhoods anymore. Things around just city services like picking up trash or crumbling infrastructure. Things around just um, problems, quality of life problems that we have in our district around um, alcohol licenses and, and bad actors that have alcohol codes. Um, the reason why I, I'm qualified is because of the experience that I bring um, for the, the, the things that I've done. Um, also the leadership that I've shown on city council, I chaired the finance executive committee, city utilities and zoning on um, three issues that are really important to our, our district. Um, but most importantly, you know, I've, through the 27 years I've lived in this neighborhood, I've built um, deep relationships across the entire district. We've worked on problems together. Um, we know kind of what works, what, what we've tried that has and what we've tried that hasn't. And I wanna put that experience to work for District 6 and addressing the concerns we have facing us today. Thank you. 
Thank you. And next we have Katie Vopel. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Morningside and Piedmont Heights for putting on tonight's forum. I'm excited to hear um, from these prestigious, prestigious neighborhoods. And I see we've got great representation from the rest of the District 6 as well. My name is Katie Volpel. I'm excited to be uh, running for City Council District 6. Um, in 2016, I moved to the Virginia Highland area um, after receiving my master's in architecture and community design. I started off um, working in the hospitality industry of Inman Park when I noticed that the Virginia Highland Business Corridor was not quite up to what my degree would say it could do. So I decided in 2018 to co-found Beautify Vihai to start with beautification of the North Highland Corridor. And in 2020, we um, kind of rebranded to Virginia Highland District as an all-encompassing community engagement um, business um, uplifting nonprofit, 501c3. So I would like to get past the hurdles and the ceilings that I met with my nonprofit at the city level and really listen to the residents and what they would like to do. Um, I believe that with my leadership skills, my community engagement skills, and my fresh ideas that I can really get things done for District 6. In terms of my platform, I'm really excited to um, focus on safety and infrastructure improvements, as well as supporting community initiatives like those hosting tonight and small businesses. Thanks. So all of you have mentioned uh, uh, issues that you're interested in and things that, uh, uh, that uh, reasons why you're running. Uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of those in detail tonight, but to begin, and I'd like to begin uh, this round with, uh, with Alex Swan, uh, what is the most important improvement or, or, or thing that you can do uh, straight off the ground to, to have some positive impact for the district? I think the first thing I want, uh, there's two things I want to do. Um, first meeting of uh, in January. Number one is I'm going to introduce a piece of legislation that does an accounting, ask for an accounting of the Renew Atlanta and TSPLOS funds that the voters approved uh, during my second term. Um, the projects have languished, they've stalled out. I want to make sure all the dollars that we ask the taxpayers to give us um, to be able to do those projects can be accounted for, um, what the gaps are in terms of uh, schedule and delivery, um, and how we get everything back on track. Um, I think that's the very first thing we can do and get to work. We have the funds, so let's get to work on the infrastructure. The second thing I'd like to do is introduce a revision to the alcohol code. Um, you know, I know that there's a, an organization out there of consisting of uh, neighborhoods um, across the city uh, that have uh, proposed some amendments that will help uh, protect neighborhoods uh, against some of the challenges that we've been facing um, on, in, in all corners of our district. I mean, uh, Cheshire Bridge, and most recently, you know, we're, we're fighting one uh, down here, down the street from me in Morningside. Um, but those are two things that I think we can get to work on immediately. I know that there are other issues around public safety and zoning that need to get addressed. Um, those are gonna take a little more time, but I think these two are ones that we can get to work on right away. Katie Volpel, what are your priorities? Thank you for asking. My first two priorities, my number one priority is to get trust back into the government, into the local government. Um, I've found with my nonprofit that engaging the community is one of the first things that you wanna do to make sure that we're all on the right track. Um, for short, infrastructure is gonna be a big one for us, especially with the t 2 coming. I would like to create more transparency in the last t -SPLOS and also in the future of this t -SPLOS so that we can have a good breakdown of what these people will be voting for in the next election for t 2 um, I think for sure, I would like to meet with all of the associations, MPUs and business associations to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'd like to create like a, a newsletter and a quarterly um, check-in and get everyone on the same page across District 6 and not piecemeal from neighborhood to neighborhood. And Courtney? Um, thank you so much. So in all the door knocking and 
um, communicating with clients that come in and out of my business and with my neighbors, I think the very first thing we have to do is address crime. Um, my business being over on Cheshire Bridge, we are in the center of it all. And I have been um, actively fighting a battle with what Alex mentioned, the uh, businesses that have illegal um, nightclubs. I closed one down that was operating above my uh, business and my space was actually their previous illegal nightclub where someone was murdered in the parking lot. So that's where a lot of uh, the crime is coming from, from Cheshire Bridge, these um, places that are, should not be operating. Um, and so number one, I will shut those down. Um, and number two, as the daughter of a police officer, I'm really interested in bringing back um, and expanding the existing fund um, that's available now to make affordable housing for our first responders. We really need to um, make them part of our communities, be part of the fabric of our communities, have cars that they get to take home. And after speaking with the Atlanta Police Department, one of the things that they said they're having the most difficulty with is retention. Um, City of Atlanta offers great training. And then um, the outside suburbs come and offer uh, better pay and better benefits. And currently there's no incentive for police officers to stay. So we wonder why we have a crime issue is because we're understaffed and because um, we've got six month rookies training brand new right out of the academy rookies. And that's a real problem. We need to have real leadership among our um, police officers. So while there's many parts of that we need to fix, certainly vilifying them in broad strokes is just not the answer. So um, I 100% will get us up to our staffing numbers and do whatever it takes to um, ensure that we have retention among our officers. Courtney, Didi, I'm going to stay with you for this next question. And okay. it's something you've already touched on. District 6 uh, represents 12 Atlanta neighborhoods, and each one of them has a little bit different uh, unique mix of residential and, and commercial interest and, and those uh, uh, mixed together in, in, in different ways. How do you plan to support and balance the needs of both residents and businesses in District 6? So if there's anything I'm good at, it's balance. Um, owning a doggy daycare, I don't know if you know anything about dog people, but you got to be able to balance the needs of our dog people with what the dogs actually need and balancing work-life balance for my team. Um, so I'm very open to um, being accessible. I think that the first thing we have to do is listen to our communities and make sure small businesses are included. I think a lot of times we go to the neighborhoods and businesses are left out. That's how I feel right now and why I'm running because we have this major catastrophe on Cheshire Bridge and people, and this is not just impacting like my business, but it's affecting Morningside with the drive-through traffic, which has increased crime, I'm sure. And, um, you know, so I think just making sure that we're having an open dialogue, um, getting businesses involved in coming to the neighborhood meetings. Um, when I first opened my doggy daycare, I started going to Lynn Ridge Martin Manor neighborhoods, um, listening to the concerns of the people because I am part of that community. And I think businesses need, and the business owners really need to make an investment and in adding value and not taking from the communities that they serve. So um, really just being open, accessible, encouraging people to come to these meetings. Um, you know, on the Cheshire Bridge corridor is the gateway to District 6, and we started a coalition of businesses, and I think that that's the first place to start is getting the buy-in from the businesses and then providing the information because it's a win-win. You know, when you're involved in your community, the community will then support your business. So that's my plan. Thank you. Alex, Juan? So my answer to this is pretty simple. All you need to do is look at the, my track record during the two terms I served. I mean, I, I built a, a solid reputation of being a staunch neighborhood, neighborhood advocate, but not at the expense of the businesses. Um, you know, the, the, anytime there would be a proposal or a need or a development, um, the first thing I would say is, have you met with the neighborhoods? And, and, and do we need to everybody sit down and talk about your project and talk about um, you know, the, the needs or the concerns and, and make sure that you address those? You know, it's it's 
I've always said, thought it was the city council's person, uh, city council person's job, not necessarily to just champion one side or the other, but to, in certain instances, make everybody lean in. You know, but how do we find that common ground um, that actually get, makes the project a win-win for everybody? Um, not everybody's going to get everything they want, but sometimes if, if you, you give the opportunity for concerns to be um, uh, lifted, and then for them to be addressed, you might actually end up with a product that's that's better than um, either one of the two opposing sides might have liked. You know, I'm, I'm all, I've always attended uh, neighborhood meetings myself um, just to make sure I can hear directly from uh, the constituents and the residents and the business owners um, what their direct concerns are. And, and it's that accessibility and openness that, that I think fosters that uh, spirit of collaboration. So you, know, you just need to look back uh, at, at my track record and know that I'm going to you know, bring that forward again uh, as your next city council member. And Katie Volpel. Thank you for this question. I think it, they're both very important. And I think that both the civic associations and business associations of each neighborhood do a incredible job with the resources or lack thereof that they actually have. Most are run by volunteers. I have been on the Civic Association of Virginia Highlands since 2018 which is the same year that I uh, co-founded Beautify Vi High and later in 2020 um, reinvigorated the business association. So I know very clearly that they have different missions, but they can both work very well together. And that's what the neighborhood really needs. Each neighborhood is gonna have their own specific set of uh, issues. So it's important to go to each neighborhood, but also work with all of the neighborhoods hoods together to uh, crowdsource issues that we can all work through together. I think it's a big issue that we cannot just expect our residents to be able to support our businesses solely. I think we really need to have connection between our neighborhoods so that each neighborhood can visit other neighborhoods and that way we can grow our visitors even from out of state into our neighborhood and even into district six. I think we need connection between our neighborhoods so that we can have variety and diversity. And that way also I would like to give um, more support to those associations who are doing a lot of the groundwork. It's a big part of my platform to give some sort of funding or representation to these associations that are doing the work. Thank you. Here we come to a subject that uh, I think is near and dear to a lot of people in, in this district. The city of Atlanta has been working to update the tree ordinance all year. And the current draft of the plan from the planning department, uh, in the opinion of a lot of people, doesn't protect the tree, ca tree canopy and will easily allow developers to clear cut trees. City Council directed the planning department to work with the citizens group for tree protection to create a blended draft that incorporates many revisions from the citizens group version. A vote regarding a final tree ordinance version could take place later this year with the exist existing council members or early next year uh, when uh, the new council arrives. Talk about the differences as you understand it between the original version and the blended version uh, created in collaboration with the citizens group and tell us which version you support and why. And let me begin with Katie Volpel. I don't remember who began the last, I think you had the last question, but we'll go with you for the first, this one. Is that me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think our trees are the most important part of Atlanta. It's very important to keep our trees just and not just for, for beauty, um, not for life, but for also for watershed. I think we need to put the priority on the trees. I understand the need or want for a blended draft, but I think the city uh, planning department has done a great job of working with the citizens group and we need to lean towards that. I think that once we set a clear groundwork or um, foundation and frame, that it can be easier for developers to work around. We need to put the priority where the priorities are so that people can work with what we're working with. We're, it's not a negotiable situation for me. It's 
we need these trees and these are the guidelines that you need to work by. Uh, Courtney D. Dye. Thank you so much. Um, so for the last um, 18 months, I've been running a business through COVID. So I don't know, and I, I'm just honestly saying, I don't know, but I will tell you one thing, that trees are incredibly important. We must have them. Uh, coming. We have to have trees to handle the stormwater problems coming from Morningside Preserve. I don't know if anybody's seen Peachtree Creek, Creek lately, but it is whitewater rapids um, or brown water, should I say. And so, um, you know, my biggest thing is I really wanna make sure that the zoning is very individual um, and that we're not allowing developers to come in and mow down trees. So what I'd like to do is seek out experts. And like I said earlier, creating um, a relationship between the, the neighborhoods and the businesses, same here, relationship between me and the experts in this matter so that I could be better informed when making any sort of decision. And also just talking to my community members to make sure that they are informing me as to what they want, because anything that comes across for me to take a vote on, I'm only gonna look through it with one lens and one lens only, and that is what does the community feel about it? So thank you. Alex Wine, do you agree? What's your opinion on? Yeah, so I, I too, I, I, I couldn't tell you specifically the, the differences between the two versions. Uh, I've been out of the loop um, on that one, but I will tell you if it does get punted to the next term, these are the things that I'm going to look for. First of all, I, I, I think in terms of the plans that are submitted for any sort of construction, um, we need to empower and resource the arborist to make sure that he, she, or that entire department are able to um, inspect it and make sure that it's reasonable. Um, and then most importantly, that what is actually done on a lot or a property or a project matches what was um, proposed in, in the plans. Um, so I, I think that's really important. Too often developers go in there and they'll, they'll tell the city one thing, but then when they actually go do the project, it's, a, it's something completely different. The second thing I'm gonna look for is to make sure that the, the tree recompense um, schedule, uh, if you take down a tree and you pay the, the recompense fee, that it is, it is meaningful. It isn't just, oh, I'll factor that into the cost of doing business and, and it doesn't even sting so that you know, all the clear cutting that is happening across the city, um, the, devel the developers don't feel like it's any sort of financial um, uh, consideration. So that's the second thing that I'm gonna look for. And the third, thing I'm gonna, uh, the third thing I'm gonna look for is to make sure that that money that is collected from the tree recompense actually goes back um, and is used for tree preservation, conservation and other activities. And it's not just sucked up into somewhere else in the general fund to pay some completely unrelated um, project. I know that's mandated by law, but I do remember firmly that we, we had to stay on that on city council last time to make sure it didn't happen. And the last thing is, uh, again, going back to resourcing the arborist, this notion of trees just coming down on the weekends and, and there's no, that cannot happen again. Homeowners have become smart enough that they use that to get around. Um, and so, you know, we've got to re, you know, step into that and make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. So those are the things I'll look for. And I look forward to studying it further when I'm back. Great. At least judging from some of the yard signs that you see in part of this district, uh, uh, this is a question I think that has, uh, that a lot of people are interested in. The Department of Planning's new zoning proposals and the comprehensive development plan are set to be adopted by city council later this fall after going through all the neighborhood uh, planning units. And the new proposals include allowing accessory dwellings, also known as ADUs, also known as mother-in-law suites, also known as granny apartments, uh, smaller apartment buildings, in other words, uh, that would add more density around uh, MARTA stations and residential neighborhoods. Do you think these proposals uh, uh, fit the need for affordable and workforce housing in our district neighborhoods? And let's begin uh, with uh, uh, Katie Voltel on that one again. Yes, I've definitely seen the signs, especially in Ansley Park on rezoning. It is with my background in master's in architecture and community design. We know that Atlanta is going to have to densify. We know that we're going to have to build affordable housing to, in, uh, to accommodate the influx of people coming in. 
uh, definitely architecture will tell me that around transportation hubs is where the density should occur. Um, definitely the city of uh, Atlanta city planning department has done multiple studies on the corridors that would be best suited for this type of density. I think that some neighborhoods are pulling more weight on the affordable housing density rezoning front. I think we need a full overlook on how our district is really being affected. And so that it's not a full city broad stroke like Atlanta sometimes likes to do. Um, especially around the uh, major corridors, we do need to densify. I am in favor of accessory dwelling units as a general rule for me, but I do see in some areas that it can be detrimental to the character and quality of the neighborhood. So as a representative, if this were to come to my table, I would definitely want to engage the neighborhood greater and see if it's a broad stroke or if we're being delicate. It also goes back to the developers and them promising affordable housing. There is a, a way to have affordable housing naturally and incentives for developers to actually make it affordable because I've gotten a lot of feedback that affordable is not affordable um, and you're just making more money for the developers. Alex Wan, what's your yeah. take on this? Yeah, I've been very public about my opposition to this uh, the legislation and I've taken heat on it um, from uh, um, urbanists who, um, on social media who uh, are, are supporting it. So <laughs> I've been in the fight for a bit. Um, I'll tell you why I don't. Number one is just because you add density doesn't mean you automatically add affordable affordability or workforce housing. I mean, the proposals that they're talking about, you could take a, a deep lot in Ansley Park, divide into three, but those are still going to probably be 750 to a million dollar homes. That is not affordable in the, in the sense of affordable housing, nor is it workforce housing. Number two, I, I've never supported blanket um, amendments across entire zoning codes or, or uh, yeah, zoning categories. I just don't think the one size fits all makes sense. An R4 in Virginia Highland is not the same thing as an R4 in Morningside, nor is it the same in terms of uh, uh, you know characteristics in, in Brookwood Hills, so I just don't think that you know trying to come in with these these just like I said one size fits all uh, matches. The third one is um, specifically around the MARTA one. You know I think we District Six we've got to be very thoughtful about this because if when the Beltline Rail comes in and if MARTA is the operator, those stops are going to be MARTA stops. So guess what? They could also be right for take a pin, draw half a mile and all the homes that, that we see around Ansley Mall, around Amsterdam, further down 10th and Monroe uh, could be up for grabs as well. So we got to be thoughtful about this. And then finally, I really disappointed in the neighborhood engagement. You know, I, I've learned from my experience working with District 6 that we are thoughtful about it. We need to go parcel by parcel, project by project. And with neighborhood input, the, the solutions are already always better. We support density. We've got examples of it across the district, but they, you know, we understand topography, we understand transportation infrastructure, we understand neighborhood usage, um, and we can help find density the place uh, at, at where it really should go. So thank you. I'd like to go around just in the same order again uh, to pick up on this question Tom, of- Tom, what? I don't think Courtney got a chance to answer that question. Oh, I'm sorry. Courtney, I, I, I beg your pardon. Go ahead. That, that is okay. If I could just take what Alex said and then just regurgitate it, that's pretty much how I feel. Um, you know, what I love most about Atlanta and the reason why I've chosen to plant my roots here in my business is because of the unique, vibrant individual neighborhoods. And um, blanket rezoning is the devil. I mean, and the reason for that is that one in five houses sold today um, go to large corporations and it's um, usually bought over market rate. And once we get this ball rolling, if this were to pass, Ansley Park will never be the Ansley Park we know now. And so, you know, like I said, ditto everything that Alex said. Um, this is huge to me. I mean, I, I am for density in certain areas. I mean, as a business owner, it makes sense. Uh, more clients, more dogs, you know, it, it helps businesses as well, but it's also not the Courtney D. Dye district. This is district six. And I think I need, you know, anything that we do, like I said earlier, has to go through the community. What do they feel about it? And then like what Katie said, we have to be using our corridors and planning those really well with complete streets and things like that. So that we're not destroying the neighborhoods that we once knew. 
And that's why I love this place. That's what people love about Atlanta is that each and every neighborhood is so incredibly unique. And, you know, just because somebody wants to push this zoning and say that de density is exactly what we need. Well, guess what? That person doesn't live in Ansley Park. That's not where they chose to make their investment. And they don't have to live with the consequences of passing this for those people. So that's why it's so important that we communicate and listen to the community feedback and take that um, to vote. Thank you. So I'd just like to go around again, and I'm sorry, uh, Courtney, for, for missing you on that first round, but to ask each one of you, and we'll, we'll go in the same order with, with starting with Katie, uh, if, if that's not the answer to uh, affordable housing, what are, is there anything, are, are there any other thoughts that you have as to um, what could be done to, to make housing more affordable? Yes, absolutely. Affordable housing, safety and transportation are Atlanta's top concerns right now with the influx of people coming. It's inevitable, we're the best city, everyone wants to live here. There are policies that I would bring into place such as mainly focusing on naturally, naturally occurring affordable housing. There's affordable housing that we have currently that is going to be torn down because of the condition that it is in. We need to be allowing these landlords to keep the affordable housing where it is, especially in our historic districts like Virginia Highland and across district six. So we need to first start with our naturally affordable housing and upgrading that to livable standards and having incentives for those landlords to keep it affordable housing. I think incentives and tax breaks for developers is the only way that we're gonna get them to actually build affordable housing and housing that isn't $300,000. Um, I live in a condo that's definitely not that. I would call it not affordable housing, um, but I would like to dream about living in a place with a backyard um, with my dog and my partner. And this is not just a dream for me. This is a dream for workers and everyone across the city. So we need to find the space and we need to give the incentives and tax breaks to make sure that it happens. And of course the accountability and transparency to the city members of the area and the community. I think we can work with other um, agencies as well, like the Beltline. Um, to make sure that this is all happening. Alex, one, what more thoughts do you have about making housing more affordable? Sure, I have a lot of ideas on this. Number one, um, land is typically the most expensive piece of a, uh, of a property or a development now, especially in District 6. Uh, I co-sponsored legislation when I was back in the past that amended the code to allow the city to contribute real property to, to projects. I think we need to lean into that. Look at the inventory of a vacant land or, or even buildings that the city currently owns. Um, and then in exchange with, uh, for donating that to a, a developer, um, we would mandate that there be affordable housing and make sure that there are enough um, conditions on that so that those affordable units won't flip down the road. Second thing is I think we need to continue the, the policy of any time a, a development receives public money, there has to be a, an affordable housing component. We've got to really make sure that we watch and work with Invest Atlanta when they're, they're giving these tax abatements um, out that, that we require that. The third one is we need to support homeowners. I, mean, I think we need to continue looking for funding um, for especially seniors that are on fixed incomes as their properties are going up, their tax uh, bills are going up. We need to find ways to be able to support them, much like the Reb West Side Tax uh, Assistance Fund. I can't remember the actual name of it, but <laughs> um, it does just that, as well as helping them maintain their homes. A lot of uh, seniors uh, and low-income families can't afford the repairs. So they're, they're kind of forced um, uh, uh, to, to sell or, or leave their homes. And the final thing is, um, well, two other things. Third one is we need to do a better job of grant management at the city. Um, we do get funds, federal funds. Uh, there are programs that do help with home ownership as well as the, the repairs and maintenance that I talked about, but the city has, has a really bad track record of administering those grant funds. So if we can do that better, we can put more dollars at use. The final thing that might not cost any money, but if we can get our permitting um, office uh, fixed, a lot of building developers would actually appreciate some sort of uh, expedited or facilitated permitting to help them get their projects underway faster. 
in exchange for that, we could uh, ask for uh, affordable units as well. So those are just some of my ideas. And Courtney D. Dye. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, so a little bit about my history as I was homeless, I um, was worked six jobs while living in a car and I worked my way and earned everything that I have now. And I think the thing that I'm most proud of is being a homeowner. And yes, it is a one bedroom condo, but whatever, it's mine. And so I would love to really, like Alex said, um, expand Invest Atlanta's down payment assistance program and make sure that people are getting um, access to home ownership. Because when we have more homeowners, we stabilize the neighborhoods. And I think a lot of people, you know, affordable housing has become a buzzword and, and people don't quite understand what that means. Like Katie said, you live in a condo, so do I. It's not considered affordable housing, but it was affordable when I bought it. And it's been a great investment. And that's a way to change legacies and futures for families for generations. Um, so I'm really big on home ownership. Um, the other thing is as a small business owner, I, I actually a couple of years ago tried to find some sort of developer that would work with several different businesses that offer services in the city of Atlanta because my dog walkers cannot live here. I may have one or two, but most of them they travel from outside in. And that's putting more pressures on our highways and byways and all of those kinds of things. And um, it's just not affordable for them to live in the city. So it would be great if the business community can come together and really rally around the idea of workforce housing. Um, I would certainly sponsor it. So maybe there's some, and I'm kind of thinking this out as I'm speaking right now, um, but if we want to offer affordable housing, maybe we sponsor an employee and we um, make sure that they have a job and such so that they qualify for that affordable housing in whatever unit. And then I also like to go and um, audit all of those buildings that promise to have affordable housing, I bet you wouldn't find them. You know, that's part of the biggest problem with the Beltline. And anytime we start building and building, it becomes a more desirable area. And I think that defeats the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. So anyway, so many ideas. Would love to keep talking about it all night. <laughs> right. Okay, we'll begin the next round, I guess, with Alex Wan. Uh, and it has to do with a familiar subject, chapter 10. Uh, the liquor license code for the city of Atlanta and license review board is in dire need of overhaul. Currently, the code allows restaurants, bars, and clubs to use the same license without consideration of capacity, location, or operating hours. District 6 has experienced gun violence, noise complaints, and other criminal activity around some establishments. What solutions would you propose to alleviate these issues for business owners and residents alike. Yeah, I said in my opening remarks, that's one of the first pieces of legislation I wanna drop is a revision to the alcohol, to, alcohol code to address just this. Um, I, I think it needs to contain several things. Number one, it needs to be very, very clear about um, the differences and the qualifications uh, of a restaurant versus a club. They're very two very, very different things and they operate and they have very, very different impacts um, in, in a neighborhood. The second piece is, is it's got to have um, steep and very specific penalties for infractions. Um, I, I think you know the, the, the flip side of that is we've got to make sure that there is political will from City Hall for uh, enforcement because that you know without that um, you know, the, the operators can do whatever they want if they don't feel like there's any risk. Third piece of it is we have to reconstitute the license review board process to make it more accountable to the public. Right now, the members of the LRB simply are appointed by the mayor uh, without council input or, or, or vetting. Um, and as a result, there is no real good neighborhood um, input mechanism into the LRB process. Um, and so, you know, they, they kind of do what they, they want, they feel, and quite frankly, um, a lot of times we'll ignore not just the neighborhood's recommendations, but Atlanta uh, Police Department's recommendations as well. We need to daylight that because, you know, ultimately it's the neighborhoods that, that um, bear the consequences of bad decisions. Um, and then with that as well, I think we need just to be more specific and clear for the LRB what a license revocation process looks like. I mean, it needs... There have been so many instances in District 6. We were successful with uh, room service lounge when I was um, in office uh, and having the license suspended, which was effectively a revocation, uh, but it's been, it, it's the exception rather than the, the rule. So, you know, I look to, and I, I'm sure that the, the, the group has other recommendations as well, but those are the things that I'd want to make sure get included. 
Courtney D. Dive, what are your thoughts? Again, I agree with Alex. Um, you know, I think also we need to make sure that the MPUs are in actually their vote, that historic, crazy, well-attended meeting about the place that we're fighting down um, in Morningside, um, that I've actually been fighting them about on Cheshire Bridge, the GOAT and Street Bistro and all of those places uh, for quite some time now. Um, you know, it, it was really disappointing to me to get on that call and have so much neighborhood engagement and then have us all be told, well, you know, they don't really, it's hit or miss whether they really listen to the community here. So I really think that we need to make sure that they're, that the neighborhood say actually means something and, um, you know, echo everything that Alex said. I think that's all the right way to go about it, but um, absolutely, you know, making sure that our community voices are heard. This is part of the fundamental problem with politics now is that people just don't feel like they're heard anyway. So then they just kind of shrug it off, you know, uh, especially the um, like younger millennial generation. Everybody's just kind of like, eh, America can't, you know, it's just, that's not the way we have. The only thing that, I mean, not the only thing, but the biggest piece of running, because I'm not a politician, never have been, never thought I would be, um, has been that I haven't been doing enough to be part of my community and win or lose, I'm not going away. I, you know, this is a huge thing and I want to influence everybody else in my neighborhood to make sure that they're standing up and they're communicating. So anyway, I think I went way off track with this, but mostly because Alex said everything. So <laughs> thank you. And Katie Volpel, what are your thoughts? Yes, I'd like to echo, especially the enforcement issue of the permitting I work with the businesses of my district and it's just simply not fair for these businesses to be doing um, outside of their permitting. First of all, it takes a very long time for Atlanta to get any kind of permit together, um, waiting over a year to have their neighbors blatantly not following the rules. So I think enforcement is the easiest thing that we can start with. I think we have the crowdsourced information of who the bad players are. And I think we need to target the bad players first, um, especially in my neighborhood, just two blocks away. We've got, um, I've been talking with some neighbors recently about um, a violator and them being open till 5.30. And it's just, it's not good for the citizens or the residents and it's not good for the other businesses. It doesn't create um, a good community. So I think starting with the bad players and then definitely getting some good enforcement and um, repercussions. Um, again, we know who these people are and we're just not really working what we have to enforce the permits that we're giving. Great, thanks. Courtney Didi, this obviously is an issue that uh, is very central to you. So I'm going to begin uh, with you in this round. Cheshire Bridge uh, has been closed since August 2nd because of a fire and the subsequent gas leak. And this busy corridor is now closed with an estimated 18 months to rebuild, which is a long time to go without colonnade fried chicken. I can, I can tell you that. Many of the District 6 neighborhoods are experiencing increased traffic because of detours, and some businesses are already suffering from COVID and facing closure. So what strategies are you going to provide to support the reopening of Cheshire Bridge? Well, yeah, so um, this is a huge issue to me because overnight we lost 40% of business and I chose Cheshire Bridge because I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see. I know that that can be an absolutely beautiful, walkable, wonderful, well-planned entry to our city. Um, and it's incredibly important that we actually get the city to answer the phone. That, that would be a start. Um, part of the problem is that Nobody is communicating to us. Um, and so we need to get some major open communication here. I, it sounds a little bit like a con conspiracy theory, but I know that the businesses along Cheshire Bridge have irritated people for a really long time. It feels almost like this is intentional, that it's taking this long um, to reopen the bridge. So I think we really need to sit down and really plan a really well thought out Cheshire Bridge get the businesses involved, the communities involved. And then um, 
I don't know. I'd really love to just have a conversation with the bridge, bridge engineer. I'm no engineer, but my um, I've got lots of family members who are civil engineers. They've come and they've looked at it and they are like, what is happening? So there's something not quite right here. So I don't have a solution right now. I just know that it needs to be fixed and 18 months is unacceptable. I am sorry to everybody on this call because my clients are driving through the neighborhood. I'm driving through the neighborhood. It's the only way to get to me. Um, and you know, then we have a problem there. We need more speed cushions and we could go down that rabbit hole right now too, but it's not fair that the community is having to, and the neighborhoods and the children and the people that have to walk or bike are having to be put out because the city is dragging their feet on a bridge that could be fixed so much quicker according to about three or four experts that I have spoken to. So I don't have the answer, but I know it is not right. And we need to get the city opening some communication with everyone and get some honesty. Katie Valpel, you uh, uh, have some educational and professional uh, uh, qualifications to talk about this. What, what do you think could be done? Yes, I think as well, which what Courtney was saying, communication with the community is going to be the top thing um, at the easiest level that we can affect. So there's really no communication around it. Um, very little detour signs, um, very far distances to go for the detours as well. I think it is also a political will like Courtney was saying for maybe they just don't have the priority of Cheshire Bridge, which I feel like we've been able to see over the years. Cheshire Bridge needs help. And I think it's one of the top priorities for District 6 as well as North Highland and Monroe. We have seen time and time again, our money in t -Sloss not prioritized to our district. And we need to have the political will to spend the money and fix the things just as when I-85 was burned down, we were able to fix that pretty quickly. And there was great communication around it in terms of, we got this, we can do this, and we're gonna do it quickly. That's not the case with Cheshire Bridge and it's just down the road. Alex Swan, I'd like to hear what you have to say. I'd also like to, to hear whether you agree that there is a difference in the way these two uh, uh, bridge disasters have been treated. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone on this call and anybody who's been in the neighborhood long enough knows the the belief, the firm belief that I have in, in the Cheshire Bridge Corridor. You know, I want to, I've always tried to and wanted to work to honor the neighborhood commercial designations that the neighborhoods and the business communities came together to set almost two decades ago now, it feels like. And, and I'd spent a lot of political capital in 2012 trying to help accelerate that. So, you know, it's, it's something that I've always supported and I hope the community um, recognizes that. You know, it does strike me that the, the striking difference between when the bridge collapsed over 85, um, and that was during my, my second term, versus what is happening now, and, and how quickly and how accelerated that repair happened, yet this one seems to be dragging on uh, longer and longer. I mean, I think there are a couple of things. Number one is, you know, I know that when that happened, because of the, the impact um, in, in the, the bridge, the 85 bridge collapsing, the negative impact that it had on our community, I leaned on the mayor um, at the time, the administration, to work also with the Georgia Department of Transportation um, to figure out if there was a way to accelerate that. And the answer was yes. And, and GDOT came in. And if y'all remember, um, they added financial incentives to the, the contractors to be able to accelerate that project. You know, we need to, we've got the Atlanta Department of Transportation now that should be overseeing this project. And, and it's just a matter of needing to lean into the administration. Um, and, and if that is what it takes, we've got $150 million in reserve. Um, this seems to be one of those uh, situations that rises to the level of being able to tap into those, uh, those funds for an emergency. I mean, I think this qualifies to be able to accelerate that. Um, and that was just something that I stayed on with the administration as well as GDOT to understand the status and um, how we could accelerate that. Do I think the city is ignoring or deliberately ignoring Cheshire Bridge? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, I tried what I tried in 2012 and it didn't work, but the, the market has, has kind of taken uh, and, and slowly tried to build up momentum. And there's been a lot of uh, redevelopment activity uh, on the corridor. I think we just need to go back to the, the property owners. Um, there are a number of them that own several parcels and lots and, and, and encourage them to continue uh, honoring the vision of the neighborhood in the, in the NC designations. Great, thanks. 
Katie Volpel, let's begin with you uh, on this round of questions. We all know uh, that during the last uh, 18 months of, of COVID, uh, there's been a great strain on the already undermanaged city services like trash and repairs uh, because of inefficiencies and problems in hiring. What are your plans to improve uh, those services uh, for residents without increasing taxes? I have been thinking about this for quite some time. It's definitely come up in my neighborhood multiple times from the Civic Association. We get something on our website uh, contact page quite frequently about the trash and um, utilities services from the city. As the first thing I feel like I should do is get on a trash truck. Like what is taking so long? What is so hard? Of course there are understaffed and I think that that puts a strain on everything. So I wanna definitely support those people and our, our service men and women who are working to get the job done valiantly. But also I know that this whole system can be systemized whether with technology or even just better routes or more communication with the community. We can work together to get these things done. I think it's one of the, since we're paying for it, it's one of the minimums that we can provide. Um, it definitely makes the city go round. We all have trash and we all need it to be picked up. Um, so I think I wanna, I wanna sit down with them and check and see where the hangups are. I'm unclear at the moment where the hangups are. I just know that we're kind of blaming five different things. And I think we need to get some boots on the ground and in the, the truck to shadow these people and find out where the hangups are. Courtney D. Dye, where do you think the hangups are and what can you do to improve the situation? Well, um, the understaffing is the biggest problem. Every business, it's not just the city of Atlanta, every business is struggling. I have paid $8,000 since January in Indeed ads, and I have hired one person, one. That is what we're struggling with at the city of Atlanta. I think just personally, we overstepped. We gave everybody a reason to stay at home and not work. People got lazy. We need to develop some really great incentives to get people back to work. Um, even though I have tried that as well, I, I'm not a big business. I'm not, I don't, I don't have a big chunk of money to sit out and say, oh, here's a signing bonus of a thousand dollars and you get it, you know, 500 here and then 500 at six months because you've stayed, but you know, and that's probably not enough to get people to come and work the trash trucks. But I'm going to say that that's really the issue. We're, we're struggling with that and we've got to find, and I don't know, maybe we get the business community together when you put us all in a room, we can come up with some really great ideas. Um, but we have to incentivize people to get back to work. And I'm always about a hand up and not a hand out. So I really think we need to start thinking a lot about how we approach helping people in the future. I think, um, you know, I was told so many times, well, I could just sit at home and get unemployment. So that's a problem. And, and I'm not saying that I don't pay my people enough. Most of my people are making more than 16, $18 an hour. So that's not the problem. It's a cultural problem. I don't know if it's a marketing campaign about let's get back to work, something heartfelt. People are tired. COVID has worn people out. So we've got to create, you know, let's give the world a big hug, especially the city of Atlanta, because that's what it needs. And let's get people back to work, incentivize them to do so. And then our trash will be picked up. That's all we got to do. Alex Juan, you have uh, some experience. I, I guess you could contrast our situation today with the way it was a few years ago. Uh, what do we need to do and, and how much different is it really? It's interesting. When I was researching the legislation that I, I sponsored or co-sponsored during my two terms, one of them I found was a, a request for the Department of Public Works to conduct a study on uh, to evaluate solid waste and recycling collection. And it, it, it reminded me that we were already having staffing problems back then. Um, you know, this, it's just not a job uh, that that is particularly enticing to folks. And I will say, and I, I want to go on record by saying that the, the, the city em, uh, employees really want to do a good job. I mean, I think they're there um, and, and I, I do uh, applaud them for that. But the problem is this is not a, a single incident or our issue. This has been a recurring problem for some time. And I, I think what we need to do is just reevaluate our entire business processes. 
You know, I remember the, the commissioner at the time talking about there's technology out there um, for trucks to be able to go and, and um, automate the process of, of an arm coming over, picking up the Herbie Kirby's so that you can all of a sudden automatically reduce the number of people that you need on a truck. So if this staffing reduction is going to be a permanent um, uh, phenomenon, then, then we need to uh, react accordingly and, and look into other ways uh, of doing this, the, the same processes. This is, I'm sure other municipalities are, are facing the same thing across the country and, and they're managing to figure it out. We need to go see what they're doing and take their best practices. Um, the other thing I will say is I, I really think, you know, it, uh, I served on the mayor's um, Blue Ribbon Commission on Waste and Inefficiency. And one of the things that, that I, I, I realized at the time is that a lot of times employees have really good ideas as well because they're doing the jobs, they're working, but we don't give them enough opportunity to either compete as a department for the, the jobs that we then think we can do better with uh, outside contractors or let those ideas kind of bubble up to, to be more efficient. Again, I said the city employees want to do a good job, but I don't think we empower them enough to, to let those ideas come to us for innovation. So uh, I hope we can do better uh, come next administration. Courtney, Didi, this is a, a different question, but in a way it's sort of, I guess, for a business owner, maybe it's it's the other side of the coin. Before COVID, it took an average of about eight to 10 months to open a business in the city of Atlanta if you had an expediter. Now it's taking as long as 16 months. And that includes the entire permit process from building occupancy, uh, business license, and a liquor license. What could you do to improve these services for businesses without increasing, again, without increasing taxes? Sure. So um, there's a lot of things that I think we can do to address this. And one is, um, I'm going to kind of back into this answer here. Um, so what I have learned through this process is the city pays a lot of money in late fees for paying bills because we don't pay our bills on time. Um, the city of Atlanta is incredibly inefficient. We need uh, a city manager or a lean director who can come in and evaluate all of our processes. When I went to go get my business, it was also during the time the city was hacked. So we started the process in, you know, uh, I don't remember April and it was like a three week, a three month build out, you know, during this process, pulling permits and going down to zoning and getting approval. And it's really just so incredibly inefficient. We, you know, you're run up to one level and then they're like, oh, well, you didn't get this, so go back down. And it's not like you get right back to the front of the line, you go to the back at the end. And that's just like a, a one person example of what is happening at City Hall. So um, to answer the question, which I'm just gonna read again to make sure that I'm like staying on task here. Um, yeah, efficiency. That's the biggest thing. We need to make sure that each department is communicating effectively and everything is step by step by step and not in some sort of random order. We also just don't have people going out right now doing the inspections that people need. And that's one of the biggest issues is that they're not showing up. I was going to move my business right before the fire to Beaufort Highway um, to expand into a larger uh, space. And the contractor <laughs> straight up told me, it's gonna be about a year. So you're gonna be paying rent on this space for about a year. Are you sure you wanna do that? So these are the kinds of things, like we know that there's a problem, we need to address it now. The, the businesses are here to create jobs and they're here to pay taxes and they're here to create value for our communities. So whatever it takes to get, thank you, um, the city running in an efficient manner so that businesses can quickly open their doors because nobody has the money right now, especially after COVID, to sit around and pay on a building that is not operational. Alex Juan, this obviously is not a, a, a new question, but the problem's getting worse. You know, I think, I think, you know, one of the strategies that we started talking about um, that apparently has not been implemented since is the notion of triaging. I mean, there are permits, there are building permits, there are business permits that, that are easy. I mean, they're simple, they're routine, um, that should just be able to be handled either online, um, automatically through a system, and you just move on. Um, versus having them clog up the entire system. This then frees up uh, the, the inspectors, the permit uh, processors to be able to focus on the more complicated ones because that's really the ones we, we want them working on. Um, so I think this notion of going back and, and revisiting all of the permitting processes to see how can we better triage the simple, non-complicated one 
get those out of the, you know, unclog this, those from the system. And then again, focus on the ones that are more uh, complicated. I, I don't think that applies to alcohol licenses though. I will say that I don't, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to slow that down a little bit. Maybe not to the extent that it is right now, but uh, I don't like the idea of automated and, and you know, automatic renewals and stuff. The other thing that I, I think we need to talk about is, is building a culture of getting to yes. Um, I think what I hear from builders and permit applicants is that a lot of times they go and um, the, the staff are so focused on making sure that they're in, you know, folk, uh, enforcing the code, um, but they don't take that next step to say, okay, this is where you violated it or where you don't meet it. This is how you can get to um, solving the problem. So that too could speed up the pro uh, process is that if we build that culture of not just saying no, but no, and if you do this, um, come back and, and you'll be fine. So I, I think there's kind of a process piece, but there's a culture piece that, that would be kind of fun to work on to, to help uh, break the logjam. Katie Voltel, what do you uh, propose to break the logjam? Short answer, I would lean into the organizations of the community, the, our MPUs, our civic associations, and our business associations. My um, nonprofit works very hard with our businesses and we have had multiple openings after COVID being blessed um, after a hand, dozen uh, vacancies. And they have worked way longer than 10 months. So the before COVID is a nice um, fun comparison, but now we're almost up to two years and it's imperative that we get these businesses open because these are business owners that we're talking about. So my platform really centers supporting business owners. Um, I, t I absolutely agree that we need to relook at the process of um, maybe even getting, like Alex said, some technology involved to expedite um, easier uh, permits. But I think that leaning into our MPU system and the people who are on the ground doing the work, and then also having um, an overall look at our permitting system would be the first place to start. Just it, throwing the question out there for all three, I, the, we've sort of had a, a, a sort of suggestion that maybe there should be, what would it be like a two tier uh, uh, permitting system or something that uh, makes a distinction uh, between businesses, could could each of you sort of going in uh, around the same order here, uh, talk a little bit about how that would work? How would you distinguish uh, Courtney D. Dye between one sort of business and, and another in terms of the red tape involved? Um, sure. So, I mean, obviously, if somebody was going to be opening up a bar or a club, then that's something that needs to have a lot more permitting and thought behind it. Um, something like, uh, I even think a business like mine really needs to have a lot of thought behind it. We don't need somebody opening up some really gross dog daycare that is, you know, dangerous. But um, but certainly I think we just, you know, categorize businesses. I can't sit here and do that right now, but if we've got a category of businesses, we just separate them into the different groups. So if it's an office building, what is the harm in that? Let's, let's get that going quickly. Um, and let's make sure that the zoning department is also very clear. Um, something that I ran into was pre city hacking. I was told you don't need these like, um, engineered drawings city got hacked inspector came, suddenly I needed them. So not only did that, was I spending a lot of extra money during that period of time where we couldn't be operational, but now I'm having to spend extra money on architectural drawings for X and engineer drawings for plumbing and, um, and things like that. So, you know, we categorize the businesses based on level of risk. And then that's how we determine, you know, the permitting process of priority and you know, I like the word triage, get it, get it out of the way, unclog it so that we can put our efforts towards the ones that are a little bit more complicated, which will also speed them up a little bit. So win-win there. Alex, Juan, what distinctions, how would you make those distinctions? 
think I think there are a couple of things. I, I think in terms of just businesses, I, we could look at the standard in industrial classification codes, the SIC codes. Every business has to have one, and and you basically it defines um, what type of operation you're in, and from there, um, you know, do look at what the risk profile looks like. You know, um, are there licenses required? Are there professional qualifications that have to happen in order to operate? Um, is it just a simple retail place? And then from there, you just start building out tiers, and and uh, again. The ones that are simple and and of low lower consequence uh, in terms of liability to the public or or to their customers, um, I think those are you know that might be one way of doing it. The other way, I mean, in terms of like building permits, you know, the easiest and most straightforward one is the cost of the project. I mean, if you're replacing a water heater, I mean that's pretty straightforward. People do it all the time. You know, it should not be complicated. But if you're building a, th a four story building, then yeah, that one you, you're going to need to think about because there are other implications around traffic, around you know trees we talked about earlier, uh, and even structural considerations. So, I think you just got to you know each industry and each process will have different slicers, and and you really just have to sit down and figure out um, even based on the volume, previous volumes of um, permit applications that could be an indicator too. So there are a number of ways we could look at this, but the important things you just got to make those decisions, put those new processes in place and just get those easy ones out of the way. Thanks. Sounds like there's a longer conversation that uh, is going to have to go on to reach the answer to that. Courtney Didi, this area of town no longer has a recreation center. Um, uh, there used to um, Katie didn't get a chance. Oh, to I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I skipped you again. All right. No, worries. Put house again. no I, I definitely want to echo uh, the other candidates. I would also add that a two tier uh, permitting system um, might not be enough, potentially even three or four tiers. Uh, there's a ton of different kinds of businesses that are out there. And we want to definitely look at the diversity of the business districts to make sure that the people who are looking to fill these spaces are desirable from the community. And then especially if they have the backing of the community, that could be another way to expedite their system, their systems. Thanks. Uh, Courtney, this area of town no longer uh, has a recreation center. There used to be one next to Morningside Elementary School. When and how does the city plan to address this lack of equitable services for our neighborhoods? And that's to Courtney. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Um, da, 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 da. I'm just, just reading the question again. When and how does the city plan to address this lack of equitable services for our neighborhoods? Well, certainly recreation is incredibly important. Um, as somebody who attended a recreation center after school, and one of my biggest things is bringing back as many after school programs as possible, including at rec centers um, and with you know other aftercare programs. But um, how are we going to plan this? Uh, we demand that we have these services. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I didn't actually quite connect the dots about where um, the city spending extra money where we could really fi find those funds. I think we could find a lot of money to allocate towards ensuring that these sorts of um, programs and places are available. Um, a lot of people talk about, let's create a fund for this and a fund for that. Well, I think that we can actually really um, create some efficiencies and find money for these things. So, um, you know, I don't have any experience in doing this, but I will seek out experts in making sure that I understand what it takes to um, ensure that these services that our kids and people need to be able to experience the outdoors and stay out of trouble. Thanks. Uh, I've, I've a little lost the 30 of Katie, I guess. <laughs> I'll go. Um, so we do have a YWCA over by us on North Highland, and it is one of every parent that I talk to has that as a gem of our neighborhood. Um, I could see definitely a value in adding those and adding them quickly. I know there's a lot of talk with APS right now and where that recreation center should go. I am not sure quite yet, but I think that we do need to be prioritizing our children um, in our neighborhoods, especially our high family density neighborhoods um, like Virginia Highland and Morningside, um, Sherwood Forest, 
Uh, so I think it would be a priority. I'm not quite sure where that money would come from, but I do know immediately, maybe even if it's in the master plans of any neighborhoods, then that's a, the easiest way for me to start. So the, the Morningside Recreation Center, um, we had one and it was a, a program, the, the city made an agreement uh, to program, to let Atlanta Public Schools program that. And then I, I'm assuming that with the renovation that uh, Morningside, that that, um, that is no longer there. You know, to me, you know, I, I would say that, um, first of all, I mean, we, our, our neighborhoods and our communities have the benefit. A lot of our families have resources to be able to, to provide and, and have their, their children participate in after school and, and other recreation activities. Um, so I, I think, you know, when we think about equitable and equ equ equitable distribution, um, we need to think about that as well, that, that there, the places where the recreation centers of the city are, are, are typically in communities where uh, they are not as fortunate. So uh, I would just make sure that we keep that in mind. But that said, I, I, think there is still opportunity for the city to provide resources in terms of offering programs and facilities that already exist here in our district. Um, for example, the Piedmont Park Conservancy has facilities that they run their summer camps out of um, during the summer. Um, and I hope Mark Banta isn't on this call because I'm, I'm certainly not committing it. Um, but I think, you know, that's, we got to be creative. I, I think it's less important necessarily of having an actual facility than it is um, making sure that the, those that in our community that would be interested in, in some sort of recreation uh, activities um, that, that the city has a place in and can provide those. So it'll be an interesting conversation, but again, I just, I just wanted to, to put that thought out there about when we talk about equitable distribution, um, we also th have to think broadly across the city as well. Thanks. Gonna have one last question from me and then uh, uh, each of you will have the opportunity for a few closing remarks. Uh, two or three years ago, you know, none of us communicated with each other in the way that we are doing so tonight. It, it, we, we've probably all gone through so many Zoom meetings, it seems old hat to us, but uh, because of the circumstances of the last year or so, we've all had to uh, learn new ways of communicating and engaging uh, with people. So as you look forward to this next term, how would you communicate and engage with your constituents uh, as a representative and what new ideas maybe do you have about uh, how to bring that about? Um, Katie, let's start with you. Yes, this is my favorite question. Communication is what I pride myself on actually community engagement and communication is something that Virginia Highland District uh, takes very seriously and it's exactly where we started. So to have communication across the neighborhood and even across the district, especially, um, we have to reach people where they are. We have to have all modes of communication, whether that's a newsletter, a printed magazine, a SUFA sign on the sidewalk, um, Instagram, Facebook, next door, any kind of town hall meetings, printed materials and posters, you need to get to the people where they are. And that's the number one thing to figure out what they want, where, um, where we want to go, and how we're going to get the collective movement behind any idea. We can't just say we want to do this, and if five people want to do it, that's cool. We need a whole community to stand up and say, we're demanding this, just like when the Civic Asso the Virginia Highland Civic Association was formed and the interstate was gonna come through. We need collective communication and a movement to make sure that our priorities, like we've talked about tonight, are actually having the political will behind them when it gets to city council and especially when it gets to the mayor, because we all know that the mayor can do a little bit more than um, the city council can, but I think communication is really where it starts. Courtney D. Dye, your thoughts on that subject? So I definitely think we need to do a hybrid of what we've been doing now. Um, I think people are just itching to get back in person, but also just giving people an option to be able to do this. I mean, let's face it, we like to sit in our shorts and put 
a blazer on top. Um, not saying I'm doing that, maybe I am. Um, you know, just giving everybody um, an option, uh, getting our small businesses involved in promoting whatever it is. I think I've said this on a pre prior forum that Katie has done a fantastic job in the Virginia Highlands District, making things fun. If you make fun things for people to do, and then you also give them a little bit of information while they're there, it's going to stick so much better than sending out some newsletter that when I get goes right into recycling. You know, that's just, that doesn't excite me, but it might excite some people. So I just think we, like Katie said, reach people where they are, meet them where they are, use every mode of communication. We have to stay on top of what the kids are doing these days. So if it's TikTok, if it's Reels, whatever, we have to make it fun and we have to make it um, personable and uh, relevant to the way people are speaking these days. Um, part of the problem I've found is that our time is so valuable these days and then you go to these meetings and they last for five hours. Maybe that's extreme, three. But still, who has three hours? So if we start making our meetings shorter too, we can create more engagement and actually taking what people say and making it a priority, you know, empowering the MPU meetings and things like that. If our voices actually counted and they mattered, more people would show up, but they have to see those results. So create transparency, communication, all modes, Katie doing her thing. She needs to help everybody do that. So thank you. Alex Juan. Yeah, so um, when I was a city council member, I was the first council member to initiate a monthly e-newsletter that I, well, we'd send out. Um, and we were, I was happy to uh, pass that template and database on to Jennifer Ide when she took office. But it was real important for me to have it just four or five articles in there every month to let folks know what I was working on, things that were happening in the district and, and other things that were happening in city hall. Um, so, and the, the other piece that I was really uh, uh, adamant about was that I would attend me neighborhood meetings personally. They, I wouldn't be able to go every month because some of the meetings are like the Morningside Virginia Highland meetings are the exact same day, exact same time. So you, you can't really be at two places at once. But the notion of my being there to, to listen, sometimes take heat for, for decisions I've made, but having that interaction and hearing you know, what the issues felt like uh, on the ground was real important to me. So those are two things that I would definitely um, uh, continue on. But I think we, you know, technology has changed a lot in the last four years, and it, it has become a very valuable tool. There's social media; um, those platforms now reach a broader uh, group of people. Different different platforms are reaching different segments, uh, and I think you know that is one thing that I would look to to do uh, and leverage um, uh, effectively to be able to reach more folks, particularly young folks that that we need to get their voices. Um, there are new tools in terms of interactive processes. Uh, Amir Faroqi has introduced interactive budgeting, um, which allows for people to input. They don't have to go to a meeting. Um, they can do it from the comfort of their home in front of a computer screen or, or other um, methods as well if you don't have a, have a computer. But doing that, you know, doing more of that where you're going out and you're actually asking questions and then uh, actually implementing what you receive. I think Courtney made a real good point there. People need to feel like their voice is being heard. Um, and the, the last thing that, you know, I, I wish I had done more of this and, I, and it's something I'm, I'd be looking to do. Um, it's just convening neighborhood leaders regularly. You know, MPU meetings, there are four different MPUs that cover the district. So you can't really just go to those, but just having a, a roundtable conversation periodically to go, okay, hey, what's going on? What's coming up? What do we need? Um, what do we need to do? So um, I think those four ways are ways that we can continue you know, engaging further and communicating better. Thank you. And I want to take just a, a brief opportunity to thank all three of you for running for office. We really can't have a democracy if we don't have uh, people participating in it and competing. And, and I appreciate uh, what you've, you've done to... Uh, to promote democracy in your candidacy. And before we close tonight, I would just like to go around again and uh, maybe start uh, with, uh, who did we start with that last round? Was that uh, Katie or? Yeah, okay, so Courtney, did I? Any closing thoughts, anything, issues that you think we haven't touched on and are issues that you think are important to the district that you'd like to mention? Um, certainly. I um, first just want to say thank you all so much for your time. I know it's a Wednesday and I don't know how many people are here, but I just thank you so much for taking time to participate 
and um, get to know all of us here so that you can make an educated decision on who your next city council person will be. Um, I am Courtney Didi, and I look forward to serving District 6 as our next city council member. Uh, first on my priority list, as I already said, was addressing the public safety issue. Um, I would love to have deeper conversations about that with um, with the community and get the community ideas on that as well as bringing the expertise that I have. Um, certainly there hasn't been a day that I've lived in Atlanta that I didn't think that the sidewalks weren't trying to break my ankles. And so what I really wanna do is focus on um, ensuring that our sidewalks are treated the way they should be as um, you know, a mutual uh, responsibility between the city and the homeowners. Um, I also wanna make sure that we bring back accountability at City Hall um, when it comes to our roads. And um, I'm an avid cyclist. I would really love to see our neighborhood be a little bit more bike friendly um, with protected bike lanes. So I'll be fighting for that. And um, really overall, I, I welcome anybody to reach out to me. My website is ddieforthepeople.com. I think we already have it in the chat. Um, you can reach out to me on any social media platform. would love to hear from you. And I really appreciate your support, your vote and prayers for October. I'm not October, no, we're in October, <laughs> November 2nd. <laughs> um, really looking forward to this and it's been a, um, a total honor to be here tonight, so thank you. Alex Juan, your closing thoughts. Um, I too wanna to thank everybody, uh, the organizers first for putting this together. This is no small feat um, as we know, and we appreciate your, your tenacity in, in putting this on. Um, and also to everybody who's chimed in and listened uh, um, to us have this, this conversation. That's what campaigns are about. It's about ideas. It's about um, thinking big, dreaming big and, and figuring out what we can do and what we need to prioritize. I mean, at the end of the day, these are big, big complex issues uh, that we've talked about. Um, and they're gonna take big complex solutions. Uh, and this is further complicated by the fact that come January, we're gonna have a new mayor, we're gonna have a new city council president and six of the 15 council seats are changing hands. I, I believe that there's a lot of value in sending experience um, and leadership that you know and you've seen in action back to work on the issues that are important uh, for us and not to have to simply rely on, on what you are hearing being promised from, from candidates. Um, you know the, the council person I will be. I'm hardworking. I always show up to meetings having done my homework, prepared, ready to debate and deliberate the policy. Um, I'm honest, ethical, and transparent. Uh, I was the first council member to publish all of my city council dis discretionary funds transactions so that you could see what your tax dollars were going to and um, how frugal I was because at the end of my two terms, I, I think I gave over $300,000 to the neighborhoods to, to implement the priorities that you have. Um, I'm engaged, I'm hands-on, um, I'm accessible, I'm responsive. I come to the meetings, um, you know I will be there so you know you can you know, tell me what you're thinking and, and tell me the things that, that you disagree with even. Um, I established a record of being a staunch neighborhood advocate. We fought together that the proposals at 10th or Crest Hill and, and Monroe, Oak Knoll, Elizabeth Ann Lane, you know that I'll stand by you and I'll have your back, that we'll fight together against the bad actors that have licenses and are use, abusing that privilege. And you know that I'll continue fighting for our neighborhood commercial zones and our corridors that are so valuable. But finally, you've seen the leadership um, that I've demonstrated on council. I've chaired committees. I know the budget process. Um, and I, I know how I can get our eight votes to get things done um, and then help also lead uh, the new council members. Because um, if, you know, we are also we are ones that control the purse strings and can make things go forward. But remember, we're also the check and balance uh, in case we need it to the other uh, branch of government. So I hope I've earned your vote. Alex Wong for Atlanta.com. Look forward to continuing the dialogue. So thank you again for everybody being here and for organizing this. Thank you. And lastly, Katie Valpel. Yes, Echo, definitely. Thank you to Piedmont Heights and Morningside um, for putting on this honestly awesome forum for us. We do have some great candidates. My platform definitely centers around building more trust around the uh, local government, um, creating an equitable Atlanta for all of us. I would like to have the communication so that everyone feels like they're involved in the process, as well as the responsiveness um, one of the goals that I'd like to set is to have a storefront actually that uh, constituents can come up and, and see me and ask me questions and be involved. I'd like to do more town forums um, all across the Atlantic because I think we've got something to learn from each quadrant of
Atlanta. I'd also like to focus on Beltline Rail. Um, I know that wasn't really brought up today, but I think that transportation and expediting the Beltline Rail um, plan is a top priority for me and as well supporting our small businesses and renters. I hope I've earned your vote. Um, vote Vopel in November on November 2nd or uh, early voting October 12th next week to the 29th. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for being our wonderful moderator. On behalf of the Piedmont Heights Civic Association, on the uh, Morningside Lenox Park Association and the Piedmont Heights Business Alliance. I just want to say thank you to Courtney, Alex, and Katie for running to be our new District 6 City Council representative. And we'll be happy to be working with any and all of you uh, come November. So thank you again. And we will remember we will be posting uh, this recording on all of our Facebook page, social channels, and if you follow any of our neighborhoods, you'll be getting in an email form too. So remember to vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Good night.